sure appreciate it, uh, Mark. Uh, my job today is to welcome you and to introduce Dr. George Hudler. Uh, George uh, Hudler joined the faculty at Cornell in 1976. He has taught numerous courses, including pathology of trees and shrubs, magical mushrooms, mischievous molds, and most recently, the wonder of willow. His outreach and research programs have generated more than 100 research articles in 230 issues over 20 years of branching out a pest management newsletter. He has received many awards for his educational programs, including the ISA Richard Harris Authors Award and the Stephen H. Weiss Presidential Fellow Award, Cornell's highest award for excellence in teaching. Dr. Hudler's work has helped plant healthcare professionals to prevent and or cope with girdling roots, tar spot of Norway maple, opportunistic, opportunistic canker diseases, and phytophthora cankers of beech. For his many contributions to health plant to plant health care, George was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award by the New York State Arborist Association in 2015. George, I turn it over to you. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Darren, for that uh, gracious uh, um, introduction. Can you see me? Am I up now? Or? Yeah, we can see yeah. you. Okay, all right. So I'm here to represent the Tree Fund. I've been a member of the Board of Trustees of the Tree Fund for the last couple of years and um, uh, will become the chair of the Research and Education Committee uh, as of January 1st. And so what I want to do today is just tell you a little bit about the Tree Fund and then introduce our uh, primary speaker, Dr. Brian Scherenbrock. All right. Anyways, um, so just by way of history, I because I'm new, at, uh, relatively new to the Tree Fund, I kind of feel more comfortable starting with history. And, and so here's the situation about how the tree fund came to be. Uh, back in 2001 and before, there were two major groups of uh, professionals that were involved in tree research, the International Society of Arboriculture, and then uh, at the time, the uh, National Arborist Association, which has since become the tree care industry. And the problem is that uh, when people wanted to give money uh, to support tree research, uh, they were never quite sure what it how to proceed because both organizations had their own fundraising schemes and it wasn't clear how people should proceed. But then in 2002, the two groups got together and out of their collaborative efforts uh, to make and simplify the ability of people to donate to tree research, uh, the tree fund emerged and that's what it is today is this kind of collaborative effort between the two major industries as well as now under some other industry associations as well so what do we do well in essence we uh we support scientific discovery and dissemination of new knowledge in the fields of arboriculture and urban forestry and and we do this in several ways we have grants for new research and actually dr sharon Bruck has received one or, or more of those scholarships for aspiring tree care professionals. And I don't know about you, but I think this is critical. We cannot have enough new, skilled, enthusiastic people coming online. And to the extent we can encourage that with tree fund support, I'm all for it. And then support for our board cultural education in general. Um, oops, let's see here. Okay. So where do we get our money from? Well, as I mentioned earlier, individual donations and people do make donations um, uh, on an annual basis. Some people leave a, a portion of uh, some state to the tree fund and the like. We have endowment earnings and the endowment continues to grow under the direction of our leadership. Corporate partnerships, almost as far as I know, all of the major tree care uh, companies um, in the uh, certainly in the U.S., uh, have a big stake in uh, funding and keeping the, the whole thing afloat. Community engagement events, I assume some of your listeners have, uh, have participated in the Stewart Tour de Trees, which, or Steel Tour de Trees, which I think is uh, absolutely fantastic, uh, even though I'm too out of shape to participate. Um, and then there's this legacy giving where people will uh, decide at some point as they get a, a little older, uh, that they want to leave a certain part of their estate for tree fund activity. Whoops, uh, let me back up here. Um, okay, so what are the research priorities? Uh, and by the way, note that we've given over $3 million uh, in, in recent years, but root and soil management is a big issue. That's partly why they, that's the topic today. Planting and establishment, uh, you guys know as well as I do how critical that is. Plant health care, um, that's kind of my, my uh, 
strong suit and and but but it's one of several really critical things risk assessment and worker safety i have to admit that i i become more impressed with um just what a critical issue that is um as i work more and more with tree fund and and with arborists in general and then urban forestry which is kind of a broad topic and it does cover a broad array of uh research activities we have several different kinds of research grants. We have a research fellowship grant, which is uh, no small change. They're $100,000. Uh, we gave out one last year. We don't give this every year, but we would love to be able to raise enough money to do that. We have the Highland R. Johns grant, $50,000, uh, and the John Dooling grant, $25,000. Um, and these uh, are obviously in honor of two uh, real pillars in the tree care industry. And then Jack Kimmel, who also is a, 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 has been a big player in the international grant for international research. And the picture below are some of the people that, um, that have been funded, but there are uh, quite a few more, of course, uh, as you might expect. Uh, we also, as I say, support these undergraduate scholarships, and there are uh, several of these in various people's names. And um, while they may not look like much money in view of the cost of college education these days, um, I'm telling you the the letters we get back from these people when they learn they've won the award are really very gratifying. We also uh, participate in, with uh, administration of some uh, education grants that are done at a local level, um, one in Ohio and the other one, I'm not quite sure where that's located, but in any event, those are targeted for specific audiences. So that's it. I don't want to take any more time there, but anyway, the bottom line is that our uh, goal is or motto healthy trees rooted in research if you want to learn more the uh, treefund.org uh, un uh, unleashes a whole bunch of information for you and i if you ever want to ask me a question i'm sure um available as well and you can find me in the cornell website so that's enough about the tree fund um uh, i want to now take time to introduce uh, our speaker for today uh, bryant sherbrock He's an assistant professor of soil science at the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point, which is, by the way, right next door to my home state of Minnesota. And uh, he's a research fellow at the Morton Arboretum. Bryant has uh, been very active research on genesis, classification, management, and ecosystem services of urban soils. He's presented and published many scientific industry articles on the topic of soil management uh, for urban trees. And he's the lead author of the International Society for Arboriculture Best Management Practices, Soil Management for Urban Trees. Brian's research on soil compaction has been funded by two Highland R. Johns Tree Fund grants. He's also the past chair of the Urban Soils Division of the Soil Science Society of America. And he's an associate for arboriculture and urban forestry. So I'll find a way to turn my screen off and um, uh, turn it over to Brian. How's that? Yep, looks good, Brian. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining the webinar today on soil compaction and urban trees. I'd like to start off by thanking the Tree Fund for the financial support that they've given us for our research over the years. And also thank the folks at Utah DNR and Utah State um, for helping us run this webinar. I did have the opportunity to see the registration list this morning and I was happy to see that we had over 480 or so attendees. And most of them, most of you all have identified yourself as arborists and urban foresters. So this presentation is focused on soils and soil compaction, but given the audience backgrounds, I'm going to keep it to the, the basics in terms of soil science. I've also included some time at the end for some Q&A, and I'd also like to mention if anyone would like a copy of this presentation or the, the papers that I'm going to discuss in the presentation, you can just send me an email and I'll be happy to forward you PDFs of those. And I'll show my email address on the last slide of the talk. Okay, so I, I tend to intend to cover four topics, and the four topics I want to cover are simply what is soil compaction, how does it occur, what are some of the problems it creates, and then I'll spend most of my time talking about what are the approaches that we can take to deal with it. 
Okay, so the first topic. So what does it mean when we say a soil is compacted? A soil that is compacted has a change in its pore and solids distribution. In an ideal soil, porosity is 50%, and 50% of those pores are filled with air. The remaining 50% of those pores would then be filled with water. In a compacted soil, porosity is reduced. Furthermore, the pores that remain remain are often filled with water and not air. So in an ideal soil, we have many large macropore spaces. And these macropore spaces are critical for air. Compaction preferentially decreases the macropore spaces. And the effect is that soils are often too wet and air becomes limiting for biological activity. So here's a picture of a soil from some very well-developed A horizon in an older residential, residential landscape. The granular structure that's shown in the soil allows for large macropore spaces. And here's a soil that's also, that's also from an A horizon in a residential landscape. And in this case, the soil is compacted. And you can see what was once granular soil structure is now crushed and the resulting soil structure is what we would describe as angular blocky. But more importantly, the pore spaces between those peds are no longer present. Okay, so now, so now I wanna talk a little bit about how this all occurs and get at some of the mechanisms. So soil compaction occurs when we have a force on the soil that exceeds the soil's inherent ability to resist that force. Compacting forces, compacting forces are often the first activities on urban landscapes. High quality topsoils are, are removed and subsoils are intentionally compacted to make the soil more suitable for infrastructure. Higher density and low organic matter soils are less prone to subsidence and therefore are more suitable to infrastructure. So major compacting force in the urban environment is definitely heavy machinery, however, it's not, it's, it is most definitely not the only compacting force in the urban environment. It's important to consider that force exerted is a function of the mass and also the area. So foot traffic might have a lower mass associated with it, but it also has a smaller effective surface area. Consequently, the compacting force of foot traffic may be equivalent to some of the heavy machinery we see during construction. It's also important to consider that not all compacting forces are anthropogenic or derived or created from humans. This picture shows a dense layer called the fragipan at 40 inches in the soil profile. Fragipans in the Midwest often form from compacting forces of heavy glaciers that once covered the landscape. Here are a couple pictures of other natural dense layers that have been created by cementation processes. The Ortstein layer on the left is created through cementation of iron. The dense layer on the right at about 80 centimeters is created through cementing of silica and clays. Natural density layers are also common out west, out western United States, I should say. For those of you tuning in from the Utah area, I'm sure you are aware and often deal with these caliche layers in soil. So soils and arid environments are often cemented by salts like calcium carbonate. So now let's cover some soil properties that are important to consider for the resisting compaction forces, for resisting compaction forces. First, soil structure is critical. Well-structured soils with strong aggregates will retain their shapes under compacting forces. Aggregates will easily break apart and condense in poorly structured soils. Soil texture, or the particle size distribution, is another important factor influencing soil resistance to compaction. Sandy soils that are gap graded or poorly graded will be more resistant to compaction. These soils have fewer fine materials that would fill in the voids under compaction. Conversely, soils with a wide range of particle size separates can be more optimally compressed by filling in more of the voids. The last important resistance factor to consider is soil moisture. Water helps to lubricate soil separates during compaction. However, saturated soils 
may be less compactable than a moist soil. This is because water is not compactable and at very high moisture contents, the soil particles will tend to slip rather than compact. So the net effect of force and resistance in a natural environment, such as a forest, is that density tends to increase with depth. The mass of the overlying soil acts as the compacting force in the forest. Conversely, in the urban landscape, the compacting force often exceeds the resistance at the surface of the soil. So density tends to be greatest at the surface in our urban landscapes. Next, I'd like to move on to some, to discuss some problems that compaction creates. First, compacted soil presents a physical barrier to roots. Roots were unable to grow on the outside of this soil clod, but an, unable to penetrate its interior. The bulk density of this silty clay loam soil was about 1.7 grams per cubic centimeter which would be considered a root restriction, restic, restricting density, excuse me. Tree roots that are unable to penetrate compacted soils will still grow. This situation sets up a potential disaster later down the road. This tree was removed from a compacted soil. The roots were unable to leave the planting hole. Above ground, the tree appeared relatively healthy. However, this tree would not likely live past 20 years or so since the roots were circling. As those circling roots got bigger, in diameter, they would eventually choke off all the roots and even the main stem, thus killing the tree. Compaction is a slow but lethal stressor of trees in urban soils. Soil compaction reduces drainage by removing macropore spaces, which not only hold oxygen in soils, but are also the pores for which water would drain from in soils. The soil shown here is from a compacted soil in the Chicagoland area with a high water table and also a fine textured. Compaction of urban soils is even more problematic since so many of our urban areas occur in coastal regions with already high water tables and fine textured soils. Soils that are saturated for prolonged periods of time may become anaerobic. The gray and red colors in the soil are derived from changes in the iron status due to prolonged saturation. Consequently, compaction also impacts elemental cycling and microbial activity. For example, wet soils may have limited nitrate available for plant uptake since much of the nitrogen in anaerobic soils goes through denitrification and is lost to the atmosphere. Surface crusts are very common in compacted urban soils. These surface crusts are very hostile environments for plants. Consequently, crusted soils are often devoid of vegetation. These bare soils become what we call puddled as raindrops hit them, destroy the aggregates, and disperse the soil particles, creating this platy structure shown here. These unprotected bare soils are then very susceptible to erosion. Compaction presents major problems to trees in the urban environment, but it also is a very serious environmental threat. So I'd like, now I'd like to move on to what we can, and maybe more importantly, what we should do to alleviate the effects of compaction on urban trees. Compaction, in my opinion, is our biggest challenge in urban soils for trees. This is not a simple problem, thus requires a process. The process I will cover includes four steps. These steps are protection, assessment, manipulation, and monitoring of urban soils. These steps and the process are covered in detail in the Best Management Practices Manual entitled Soil Management for Urban Trees. This is an International Society of Arboriculture publication and can be attained through their website. So first and probably the most critical step for soil management for urban trees is to protect the soil resource. Soil degradation through compaction can occur in a matter of seconds, but to fix these compacted soils, it may take years and a lot of effort, if at all possible. I could easily spend this entire presentation on the issue of protection of soils, but since so many of the urban soils are already degraded, I will only spend a moment or two on it. In my opinion, it is one of the easiest ways to protect, in my opinion, one of the easiest ways to protect soils and trees is to mulch around them. 
The mulch layers help to limit the compacting force on the soil, as well as provide many other benefits to soil quality. And also some non-soil related tree benefits, like keeping mowers away from the stems and preventing damage that might occur as this equipment rubs on the base of the tree. When protecting in situ soil and tree root systems, it is very important to extend the protecting zone further than simply the drip line. The soil outside of the fenced areas on this picture has been degraded and yet will be the soil that these trees will require if they are to grow to any substantial size and provide the significant ecosystem services we hope they would provide us. Soil protection should extend to the projected drip lines of the mature trees of the site. My, rule number two for soil protection is to stay off the soils when they are wet. As discussed, wet soils have a limited ability to resist the compacted forces in the urban landscape. We might also consider using engineered urban soils that are gap graded with coarse aggregates. This will help to increase soil strength. However, these gap graded soils do have a trade off in that they have a limited capacity to hold on to water and also nutrients for which the trees would require. Or maybe an approach might be to separate the infrastructure from the soil, such as this suspended pavement system at the Christian Science Center in Boston, Massachusetts. The soil on the site was never compacted because the infrastructure is supported by concrete pillars in the ground. Consequently, the tree growth and health on this site is outstanding. However, compaction has occurred and we as caretakers of trees are brought in to help the trees in compacted soil. This, pic this picture is from one of those situations. It is from the Baker Hill subdivision in Glen Ellen, Illinois. The soil compaction on the site is severe. The soil is a clay loam soil and the bulk density is approximately 1.7 grams per cubic centimeter. The managers of the subdivision has re replanted these trees numerous times. The oak tree shown here is again showing significant decline and will likely be in line for another replacement. So for many of these sites, adequate protection is not provided. The second step in soil management is then to assess the state of the soil resource in its current condition. We need to have an idea of how bad the compaction is. Soil assessment is critical for soil management of urban trees for a number of reasons. Two reasons in particular are one, Soil assessment will allow us to determine if a soil remediation action is necessary. And two, soil assessment will tell us if those actions have the desired effect. Soil assessment will also allow us to better match species tolerance, tolerances with the site conditions and move us towards more diverse urban force. Examination of soil structure is a very good first step for assessing soil compaction. The soil structure shown here is telling me that this soil was indeed severely compacted. In particular, if you focus in on the platy structure from the zero to 20 centimeter depth, you can see that the plates or the plates were created as water moves through the upper surface and is held at a dense layer occurring at about 20 centimeters in this photo or in the soil. The water has then moved laterally and with it the soil separates, which align themselves to create the plates you see. The image shows the layer just below that platy layer on the last photo. The structure shown here is referred to as massive, and it has no shape. This is the layer that was holding up the water, creating the platy structure above. This is obviously not what you'd want to see in your rooting soil for trees. Conversely, granular soil structure is what you are looking for. This is a soil with excellent water and nutrient properties. Consequently, biological activity is high as indicated by the dark color from the organic matter. After visually assessing soil structure, we may want to quantitatively assess soil compaction. The most accurate 
way to do this is by measuring soil bulk density, which is an expression of the soil mass per unit volume. This is done most commonly using intact core sampling. It is important to remember that although bulk density is quite accurate for assessing compaction, its interpretation requires knowing something about soil texture. The red lines on the soil texture triangle show root limiting soil bulk density values based on the composition of sand, silt, and clay. A bulk density of about 1.45 grams per cubic centimeter may not be limiting for a sandy loam soil with approximately 20% clay, but it would indeed be limiting for a clay soil with 60% clay. Cone penetrometers are convenient tools to compare sites of similar texture and moisture content for soil compaction. Cone penetrometers measure the force required to push a probe through the soil. The units are pounds per square inch or another unit of force like Pascal's. 600 pounds per square inch or so is thought to be a limiting value for which root penetration would not occur across most soil textures. However, it must be stressed that readings from cone penetrometers are influenced by factors like soil texture. Resistance through sandy soils is naturally less than some of our fine textured soils. So a loamy sand soil with the same bulk density of a clay loam might indeed have a lower penetration resistance profile. Likewise, cone penetrometers experience less resistance when moving through wet soils. So moisture content must also be considered with cone penetrometers to assess soil compaction. After you assess the situation, you, you may indeed have a problem. And if you do, you might require some action. Manipulation includes the actions you might perform to fix compacted soil. Farmers have been dealing with compaction for centuries, and tillage is one way they attempt to handle it. However, the moldboard plow is out of the question for most urban landscapes. We might consider smaller tools or implements in urban landscapes, such as this rotor tiller, or maybe we might try to reduce density by removing some of the compacted soil with machinery or tools such as this core aerator, aerator. Subsoilers might be used to try and rip up compacted layers found deeper in the soil. In confined spaces, backhoes have been used for subsoiling tools. Sometimes this subsoiling technique is paired with organic matter incorporation, such as the profile, soil profile rebuilding technique that has been developed by Dr. Susan Day's research group at Virginia Tech. And I'll show some of her data in a few slides. Another approach specifically for trees in compacted soil has been to create trenches from the base of the tree radiating out in all directions. This is done in the hopes of creating tree root breakout zones in the compacted soil. Vertical tillage has been utilized in confined urban spaces to attempt to break up compaction layers. Tillage with high pressure air has been increases in popularity over the last few years to deal with soil compaction. Air tillage is thought to be useful on both newly planted and also older urban trees growing in compacted soils. Air tillage is thought to not disturb the mature roots while breaking up the compacted soils. An additional benefit of air tillage is that it exposes the root system and any defects such as girdling roots or maybe deep planting might also be addressed at that time. Additionally, air tillage is an excellent means to incorporate treatments into the soil. Here, we are using air tillage to blend in biosolids and biochar into compacted soil on a research plot in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Aside from physically altering the soil, 
amending the soil is the second major approach folks will use for attempting to fix compacted soils. Organic amendments and mulches have shown some efficacy, which I will cover in a few slides. Composts and composted materials are another major amendment used for compacted soils. These materials supply organic matter to the soil to stimulate biological activity in the hopes of promoting biological aggregation to repair the degraded soil structure. Furthermore, they are lighter than the soil, so including them will naturally reduce the substrate density. Inorganic fertilizers might also stimulate biological activity and may also lead to increased bioaggregation. Inorganic amendments such as this lightweight expanded shale aggregate have also been used to reduce in attempts to reduce bulk density. So monitoring involves collecting data and making assessments on whether these various manipulations actually work to fix compaction. So in the next section, I'm gonna cover some of those, those treatments that I just presented to you, what we found and what others have found on their efficacy This table summarizes the research that has looked at some of the physical approaches to dealing with soil compaction. As you can see, the effects have not been overwhelming. The effects on soil bulk density tend to be minimal, short-lived, and or mixed, meaning that they work in certain soils and situations, but they don't always work across the board. The reasoning for minimal and short-lived effects on soil bulk density with physical techniques such as surface tillage is that with tillage, you might be able, and you do break up compacted layers, but you haven't repaired the soil structure. So the soil after it's tilled up will rather quickly resettle and redensify with the water that moves through the freshly tilled and now exposed soil. Conversely, approaches that have focused on repairing soil structure have been somewhat more successful. Patterson and Bates found that soil structure might be replaced with inorganic amendments and a resulting decrease in bulk density was observed. In our research, we have found that soil quality in urban landscapes does improve over time. And we have also found that these improvements can be hastened with organic materials. I will discuss a few of these findings in a bit, but before I do so, I wanted to mention that Dr. Susan Day has also found that compost with subsoiling has been affected to remediate compacted soils. And her effects are likely as a result of the same mechanisms I'm going to discuss when I go through some of our research. This figure is from some research that we did out in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. And we found that over time, soil bulk density decreased. And this decrease was observed with increasing landscape age. We found that the reason for this decrease was likely an increase in biological activity. We found that biomass and activities of soil microbes and earthworms increased with increasing landscape age. And this had a direct impact on decreasing the soil bulk density that is shown here. Unfortunately, the time frame for significant change we observed is not likely feasible from a management perspective. And what I mean by that is, is we're not able to tell our clients that have compacted urban soils to go ahead and wait 25 to 50 years and your soil quality will just naturally improve. So we have, and, and others have as well, been conducting and are currently exploring methods in which we can speed up soil recovery after soil compaction. This image is from a compaction plot that we created at the Morton Arboretum back in 2007 that was funded with a tree fund grant. The compaction performed on this landscape was done to mimic a typical construction site in which the topsoil is scraped off, the subsoil is compacted, and a little bit of topsoil is replaced. Following the disturbance, 
We planted 120 trees on this plot. 60 of them were maple and 60 of them were birch. We treated the soils with hopes of remediating the compaction with compost. The compost was applied at one inch top dressing per year. We applied wood chip, a wood chip mulch and maintained that wood chip mulch at a six inch constant cover. One of our treatments was an inorganic nitrogen phosphorus potassium fertilizer applied at the ANSI standard rate of four pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year. We applied a compost tree tea treatment at 250 gallons per thousand square feet per year. We also included a commercial biological product that had microorganisms in it and that product was applied at label, label recommendations. And of course we had a water control on this plot applied at the same rate of our compost tea at 250 gallons per thousand square feet per year. The treatments occurred over three years and the soil and tree responses were quantified for seven years following. So we did see that soil structure improved. The soil structure improved from massive to subangular blocky. And this structure or this improvement in soil structure was observed for both our compost and our wood chip treated plots. Quantitatively, we saw the same thing. So after five years, we found that soil bulk density with both our compost and our wood chip mulch was significantly lower compared to our other treatments. We saw that the improvements in soil quality, like decreased soil bulk density and some other changes that I don't have time to go into, were correlated with improvements in tree growth and health. This picture shows two birch plots. One on the left is a null or a control plot, and the one on the right in the foreground is a wood chip plot. After seven years, we saw significant increases in both species in tree biomass with wood chips compared to our control, our commercial biological product, our co aerated compost tea, the tree biomass that we measured on compost, and also our N NPK inorganic fertilizer was intermediate between these two extremes. Although significant differences were observed, we, we were actually hoping for some faster responses here. You can see that from this figure showing solar organic carbon that significant changes took a few years to actually show up. After three years, we did see significant increases in solar organic carbon with compost and wood chips. The change in solar organic matter was significantly correlated with other responses like microbial biomass, nitrogen mineralization, soil bulk density, and tree growth and health. Our conclusion from this study was that in soil improvements with organic materials were occurring because they were stimulating biological activity, both roots and microbes. So now we're looking at for, now what we're doing is we're looking for other organic materials and methods of incorporation to speed up this soil recovery. And the question we're asking is, can we get a more rapid response, say within one or two growing seasons? One organic material we are looking at with some promising initial results is biosolids. Biosolids are treated sewage sludge. The materials we are using are what's referred to as Class A certified, meaning that they do not pose environmental threats for contaminants like heavy metals. Given the re relatively high nutrient contents of these materials, biosolids are ideal soil amendments for improving biological activity. Additionally, these materials are available in great abundance in cities. This picture shows an aerial view of biosolids drying beds for the Chicago Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. Many cities offer biosolids free of charge, such as the ones we have been testing from the city of Chicago, Downers Grove, Illinois, and also Stevens Point, Wisconsin. Utilization of biosolids in the urban landscape is environmentally friendly since it reduces pressure on landfills. Another organic material we are looking at in combination with biosolids is biochar. Biochar is a charcoal-like substance that can be made from any organic feedstock 
through gasification processes like pyrolysis. We and others have, been, have found that biochars from woody materials, such as the one pictured here, tend to make better biochars for soil improvement. This is an important point to make since the urban forest produces a great deal of woody material waste. Turning this waste into a useful soil amendment is also environmentally friendly. Biochars are created through heating at very low oxygen conditions. And as I mentioned, this process is referred to as pyrolysis. The resulting material is one that is rich in carbon. It retains 50% or more of the initial carbon and its structure. So the benefits of biochars are that it's able to retain large amounts of water and nutrients and also provide habitats in degraded soils for microorganisms. Our recent interest with biochars has been to use them as a sponge to hold on to nutrients that might be released from materials like biosolids. Together, we think biosolids and biochar may work to stimulate biological activity and rapidly improve compacted soils. So we've been using biosolids bio and biochar in a number of ongoing experiments to improve soil quality. We have been examining these materials in a wide variety of settings from greenhouse to the landscape, across a wide range of soils from sandy to compacted clay to engineered urban soils, and with a wide range of urban trees. Some of these experiments have just begun and some have been going on for five plus years. I obviously do not have time to cover all of the details and present all of the results, but I would like to spend just a few moments on some results from two of our studies. This data is from a greenhouse study. And in this greenhouse study, we, we examined two tree species and we looked at three different soil types. We found that tree growth was significantly greater with our biosolids and biochar compared to wood chips, compost tea, and control we found that greater growth was a result of improved quality and this improved soil quality was created from the stimulation of microbial activity. Some of our preliminary findings are suggesting that when we incorporate biochar and biosolids together, we may see a synergistic improvement in soil quality. And this is translated into improved tree growth and health. This data is preliminary data showing the growth of elm trees in a compacted engineered urban soil treated with biochar, biosolids, and a combination of biochar and biosolids, as well as control. Preliminary findings are suggesting that biosolids and biochar might help to speed up the soil recovery com from compaction, and we might have significant responses in one to two growing seasons. So, in conclusion, compaction is definitely a very serious problem for urban soils and trees. Effective soil management for compaction includes protection, assessment, manipulation, and monitoring. My opinion is that organic materials do show the most promise for improving compacted urban soils. Compost and wood chips are certainly effective, but we're hoping and, and we think we are seeing more rapid responses with other organic materials such as biosolids and biochar. So as I mentioned, if anyone's interested in this PowerPoint or some of the papers I discussed, go ahead and send me an email and I'll go ahead and I'll share those with you. Again, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Special thanks to all the folks that helped make this webinar and our research possible. And I'd be happy to open it up to questions if you, if you all have any at this time. Yeah, we've got uh, we've got a, a bunch of questions in uh, Q and A, Bryant. So if you okay. uh, you can sort of turn there and look, I mean, I'll I'll read them off just for the benefit of everybody that's on, but you can sort of follow along. First one we had Megan ask about biochar. You talked she she asked this pretty early in the presentation, so you probably covered it. She says, "Are you familiar with biochar? Could biochar be be used as a way to reduce soil compaction and retain water? I.e., make might biochar provide some similar benefits to rock and aggregate? So anything you'd want to add there?" Sure. Um, so yes, we are familiar with biochar. We are using it as, as a way to hopefully repair degraded soil qualities, uh, degraded soils. Um, one thing I, I will mention though with, with biochar is, is one of the nice things about it is it has a long 
um, residence time, meaning that you can incorporate it into the soil one time and you wouldn't have to go and replace it. Um, whereas a compost, you have this, this, soil decomp the, this compost decomposition that occurs every year. So materials like compost, you, you have these replacement issues. Whereas biocharts thought that it's going to be a little bit more stable in the soil. Okay. Uh, Jacob um, said he's, he uh, said, I, I've always read rooting. Uh, let me, questions are popping up there. I've always read um, rooting limiting PSI to closer to 200 PSI. Is that not accurate? Well, so um, cone penetrometers, like I mentioned, you, you, have to, you have to interpret them understanding the soil texture and also the soil moisture. So that value of 600 PSI is a general threshold that, that people will, will use across soil textures and moisture contents. Mm. Okay. And yeah, I think he followed up there, or Blake did, if 600, if, if 600 PSI on the cone penetrometer in general means no root growth, how does that compare with compaction underneath sidewalks? Yes, yeah, so, so a 600 PSI on a cone penetrometer, again, a general statement now across soil textures, that's going to be a bulk density of 1.4 to 1.6 or so grams mm -hmm. per cubic centimeter for our sandy to our clay soils. Okay, so there are, there are correlations that the folks have made between cone penetrometers and soil bulk density. Um, I, I do like cone penetrometers but I, I, I have to stress that you have to use them with knowledge of the soil texture and the moisture conditions on the site. So where I, I, I particularly like them is assessing compaction within one, soil, one landscape. Okay, but comparing landscapes, it gets difficult because you, then you, you run into differences in textures and moisture contents. Uh, Kevin says, does air tillage spading work well in soils with more clay, such, such as in, in the south? Our experience is that these soils tend to re-self-compact. So, so air tillage is, is quite interesting. I, I mentioned that it, it's growing in popularity, and the, the research is still out there on it. Um, so, so we're doing research on air tillage. Others have, and there haven't been, um, there haven't been a lot of papers that have come out with results on that. I, I do know that you know some of the factors that are really important to consider when you're when you're using air tillage are the the moisture content of the soil. Okay, so you kind of want something that's pretty close to to, to field moist condition. Um, you don't want something too wet. So the day after the rain is probably too soon. Two three days after a rain is probably okay. And obviously you, you wouldn't want something too dry because when you're using air tillage on really dry soils, you're just going to create a dust storm. Okay, so you are looking for kind of that field moist condition. And maybe that has something to do with, with Jason's, Jason's issues in, in his soils. But we've used them in Chicago in, in, in very high clay content soils. So we're talking 40, 50, 60% clay sometimes. Okay, uh, and an anonymous viewer says, uh, uh, how do you address the problem of too deep planting once you uncover the root flare? Do you lift it up? lay back the soil around the tree trunk? Yeah, 2D planting is something we see, see very commonly with um, when we're using that air, air knife tool. And, that, and it's a nice thing to discover. Um, and this, this is just my opinion now. So, so my opinion is that if the tree is small enough that you can successfully pull it up a little bit, that's something I would consider doing. Oftentimes the trees you're not going to be able to do any much with it. So then maybe just blowing off the soil, getting to the, the actual depth that should have been planting at and, and moving that soil back is probably the better approach for these larger trees. But we've, we've attempted to lift some smaller trees, some new plantings after we discovered them being too deep. John, uh, John says, does a surface application of gypsum qualify as a, an inorganic uh, amendment? Yeah, that would qualify as an inorganic amendment, and it's it's not something that I can – gypsum is not something that we've looked at for some of our treatments for compacted soils. So I, I can't speak to its efficacy at all. 
Um, uh, Naomi says uh, the the study you uh, the study you did was in an open landscape, albeit c- c- compacted. Have you thought of moving this study out to curbside trees, uh, urban trees planted oh, sure. completely isolated? Sure. Yep, yeah, we have in, in a couple slides back. Um, I, I think I'm still, can I still control the screen? Yeah. Mm-hmm, sure. Okay. So we, we've done a number of studies in actual urban landscapes. Um, so the, the image right here is in downtown Chicago in cutouts that range in soil texture from sandy loam to clay that are heavily compacted. This site right here is a subdivision in Bolingbrook, um, Illinois, very heavily compacted soil. This is our newest urban landscape plot out in Milwaukee at a uh, brownfield site between the Harley Davidson Museum and Miller Park, um, also compacted soil. And these are just three examples. We have a couple other ongoing urban landscape experiments. So the urban landscape experiments, I, I agree, they're, they're critical because the things that we, we do in a greenhouse setting or an experimental plot, they have to translate out into the actual landscape. But the urban landscapes tend to be really noisy. So I like to, I like to com- conduct the same experiments in, in different venues to make sure we're seeing the trends across. Gene, uh, Gene says, is there an effective way to lower soil pH from the alkaline range to the acidic range? Um, so, so soil pH is, is definitely a, a problem that, that we deal with in urban soils. I'm not, I'm not one to, it, 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 so it depends is, is the, the quick answer. Um, and, and it really depends on the buffering capacity of your soil. So if you have a soil like we see in where I'm from, the Midwest, or specifically Chicagoland region, where those soils have a high pH, um, they also have a high cation exchange capacity. They have a very high buffering capacity. So trying to lower the soil pH of some of those soils is like throwing a glass of water into the ocean. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to respond back. And that's what that buffering capacity does. So it depends. Uh, in, in that situation, I would not recommend trying. Um, I, I would try, I would focus more on matching species with the site. Mm-hmm. So we have trees that can tolerate more alkaline soils. So maybe focus on those. Megan, I think had a follow-up question on the biochar. She said biosolids versus biochar. What's the difference? Okay. So that's, that's a very good question. And, and there's very, very important distinctions here. So first off, I'll say that biochar is, is, is not a fertilizer. Okay. So you, you, you can't be looking for it to provide the nutrients. Okay. Think of it as a sponge. It has a very high capacity to hold on to water and nutrients. So we say it has a high absorption capacity. Okay. Biosolids. Now, these are both organic materials, but biosolids has a very high nutrient content. Okay. Specifically, high nitrogen, high phosphorus. Okay. And that's where, where our interest lies in combining the two. Because sometimes the, the nitrogen phosphorus in, bio, in something like a biosolids might be too high at any one point in time for what the tree might require. Okay, so there's a real benefit to having something there to hold on to that extra nutrient and release it more slowly at times when the vegetation would, would, would want it or require it. And it doesn't, be, it doesn't, for instance, leach to the groundwater. Okay, but the biochar itself is, is not a fertilizer. Okay, so folks, folks that have been studying biochar, and this is, there, there's been quite a bit of research on biochar in the last 20 years, they found that woody feedstocks tend to be really good. Pyrolysis temperature is generally between 400 and 600 degrees Celsius. And biochars that are, that are charged. And when we say charging, we're talking about including some other nutrients with them or some nutrient with them. The uh, inorganic fertilizer, or my preference is more of an organic fertilizer or a compost, or we're looking at biosolids. Okay, so... Hope that answers your question. Okay. Now, folks, we've got a bunch. I've got 42 questions in the queue here, so we're probably not going to get through all, <laughs> all of these. Um, we'll just sort of play it by ear. Brian, you sort of tell me. I, I, I've got a few minutes. We can go. Uh, we can certainly go, go along, but let's let's we'll go five or ten minutes 
sure. over time if, if that's okay with you but we'll, we'll and I'll, I'd happy to take questions um, via email well here's what I was gonna say what we'll do for everyone too is go ahead and put your questions in Q&A when I uh, this zoom has pretty robust reporting and what I can do is uh, I'll pull these questions down and Brian I'll share them with you and George and uh, uh, sort of the other panelists too and um, you know, you you can choose. We'll also have a registration list too, so that may be something we can work with Utah State or Megan on. On uh, you know, maybe you could answer these questions and then s send them out to to the the, the entire group. But um, we'll 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 just we'll sort of knock a few more of these out, and then uh, we'll sort of wrap things up here. So we did biosolids and Charles on that same topic of biosolids and biochar. Uh, someone asked uh, whether they should be incorporated into the soil or put on the surface so it depends on your situation so in, in our experiments how we're using these materials really depends on on the setting so if we're in a downtown environment where the exposed soil is a four by four cutout in that situation we've been using um, vertical tillage so that drill I showed you as a way to drill holes and then incorporate the materials back in um, in, in our more open landscapes We've been using air tillage we, or, and or just simply mulches, okay? Um, so, so, and these all have trade-offs as well, too. Um, one interesting thing that we found in, in our Bolingbrook study in which we are incorporating um, the materials with air tillage. So in that study, we also have an air tillage treatment alone in which we do not include any organic materials with that. We actually saw with that treatment, we saw a significant decrease in soil organic carbon. And so what happened there, what we think happened, is that that tillage alone had stimulating biological activity and the microbes started decomposing the existing soil carbon resource. And by not replacing that organic matter with, with compost or in this case, uh, biochar and biosolids, we saw a decrease. Okay, so I, I, I always recommend if you're going to do any tillage to put some organic material back in. And Susan Day has found the same thing with her subsoiling technique and incorporation of organic materials, which um, they refer to as, or they, they have termed soil profile rebuilding. Okay. So it depends on the situation. Sure. One other um, thing I would, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sure. One other thing I would add to that is I'm, I, I like the mulching approach quite a bit. And there's a couple of reasons for that. So mulching just means applying the materials just right on the surface. Okay, so that mulching approach would mimic what you would see in a forest environment in which the organic materials would slowly incorporate and make their way into the soil profile and you'd have a gradation. When we start to incorporate these materials with tillage, we, we do have a potential to, to create these discontinuities in soils. And discontinuities are tend to be bad things because they might hold up water, for instance. So they might make a poorly drained soil even more poorly drained. Okay, so I like that aspect for the mulching. I also like the aspect that the mulches provide or the benefits that the mulches provide in terms of soil protection and keeping people away from trees. I like the aesthetic appearance of it as well too, but. <laughs> Joe asks, uh, in, in situations where organic amendments aren't available, are there certain tree species or genre that do better than others in compacted soil? In situations where organic amendments are not available, or I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure which, which situations those might be. Um, I haven't seen any situations in which I wasn't able to apply organic materials. Even in a heavily manicured turf grass environment, a compost top dressing quickly makes its way into that soil. And by quickly, we saw it make it w within, within a week or two. So I'm, I'm not sure. I think there's ways you can get organic materials into the soil. Um, Catherine says, uh, what, uh, what rate of application did you use for the biosolids? Biosolids, okay. So we've, we, that one's one that we have uh, an ongoing uh, greenhouse experiment in which we've uh, varied our rates of biosolids. And so far, what we found with our second year data is that what you want to do with biosolids is you want to be aware of the nitrogen and phosphorus concentration of the biosolids and you want to tailor that um, to what you're then, then you apply based on that concentration and what we found is that when we do that 
And when we actually apply at the ANSI recommendation, the American National Standards Institute recommendation rate of four pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet de uh, delivered from the biosolids, that's when we see our maximum benefit in tree growth. And when we go over that rate, we don't see any additional benefit. Okay, so and if we were to extrapolate that rate, I, it's, it's hard to do because each biosolid has a different concentration of nitrogen and phosphorus. The stuff that we were using, if we were to extrapolate that out to the landscape, that works out to about a, a, a half an inch top dressing of biosolids per year. Okay, um, but that, that's something that, that I, could, I could work with, work with uh, it was a Nancy if she was interested in trying to develop yeah. a prescription rate based on, she would have to know the nitrogen and phosphorus concentration of her, of her biosolids first. Okay. And folks, I put, uh, um, I put Brian's email in chat. So you could be rather than trying to, you know, type it off the screen. You, you may fat finger if you want to copy it from there, feel free to do that. A lot of biochar questions. Let's see if we can mix things up and get um, some other one, uh, some other ones here. Um, Says, do uh, so, uh, Daniel asked, do soil amendments include uh, micro microorganisms? Well, they do. Yeah, and and we've looked at a couple of those. So our research for so we've done about seven years of research on compost teas, and we actually have still a couple studies ongoing with them. And I would consider those microorganisms. Um, we've also looked at one commercial product that we could we purchased off the shelf that included some microorganisms. We haven't found anything too successful in terms of improving soils with either of those treatments. Okay. Uh, that's, GM, that's our research. So, and I have papers that we published on that as well too. So, yeah. contact me if you like them. Jim Jim says uh, deep root deep root fertilization is being sold as a way to also relieve soil compaction with ur urban trees. What is your opinion? Well, I mean, so I said in my approach is anything we can do to stimulate biological activity. Okay. And that's the really important thing here. Okay, we want to recreate the soil structure. So biological activity means promoting both plant growth and microorganism growth and activity. Okay, so my preference is to use organic materials to do this because then you get additional benefits such as improvement in soil structure, water holding capacity. You also apply some of the micros that maybe you don't put in an inorganic fertilizer that might be present in the organic materials. Okay, so I'm not saying that, that inorganic fertilization would not have these effects because it very well might have these effects if it's able to stimulate biological activity. But what I'm saying and what our, what our findings suggest is that maybe we get a little bit, we do get more biological activity with organic materials because of these additional benefits they provide. Cool. All right, we'll just do another question or two and then we'll wrap things up. I did, uh, Megan sent me an E, uh, or sent a message in chat and said she'd be willing to uh, sort of coordinate some of the, uh, take some of the questions that were in Q&A and uh, see if we can get Brian to follow up on those and then we can follow up via email. But we'll take another question. We'll just uh, grab a question or two more and then we'll, we'll wrap things up. Um, um, Edward says, have you experienced any use of vegetation such as radishes to loosen, to loosen co compaction? This has been used in field crops situations. Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, no, I haven't used radishes specifically, but what we're what we're we're going to be f uh, focusing on in the upcoming years is this idea of looking more closely at the dynamics of competition between turf grass and specifically different types of turf grasses and trees. Okay, I'm sure we're all aware of the competition for water and nutrients that, that trees and turf experience when they're in this, growing in the same substrate. But we've seen anecdotally in some of our, our research that turf grass also does a wonderful job at breaking through some of these compaction layers. So we're hoping to, to focus some energy and some research efforts into looking at specific turf grass environments that would help and work with trees synergistically to reduce compaction layers. I think turf grass is probably the, 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 the more preferred vegetation underneath a tree compared to a radish, but maybe not. I mean, that, that's something that we'll, we'll suddenly consider as well too, maybe. Okay. We'll take one more, uh, we'll do one last question, then we'll wrap things up. Uh, Jacob says, uh, how would you recommend addressing co compaction on a very large development site? So a very large development site um, com compacted, and if this was prior 
to trees being there, then you might be able to, to come treat that more like, you know, a field, an agricultural field in which you could use some of these larger implements to till it up. Um, I do think that you probably do want to get it tilled up after it's been compacted if you have that opportunity before you put the trees in. Um, but then recognizing that you also need to get some organic materials with those trees once you plant them, I, I believe. Okay. All righty. Uh, so with that, I think we'll wrap things up, Brian. Thank you for a great presentation. George, uh, you have any closing, uh, cl closing words you'd like to add? Well, I, I sure enjoyed the, and learned a lot from what I heard today, Brian. I want to thank you as well on behalf of myself and the Tree Fund. Um, I know we've, uh, you've gotten some grants from us in the past, and we'll probably get some in the future, but I, I uh, sure feel like we're uh, getting our money's worth, and that makes me feel good. So <laughs> thanks a lot on behalf of our group. Okay. I am going to put a link to the Learn event. I put that in chat. Um, again, a recording of this will be available within a couple of days. If I don't get it done uh, before the end of the week, it'll probably be maybe first of uh, next week. Uh, that'll be available at uh, on that learn.extension.org uh, link. And then, uh, like I said, uh, we'll work with uh, Megan and Utah State and Bryant and see if we can uh, get some of the questions answer then maybe get those responses sent out via email to everyone so brian any any closing words or thoughts oh no thank you all um thank you again to the the tree fund and the folks at utah um and and, and all of our partners who helped us out to research and yep have a good right. day everyone all right thanks bye-bye okay, bye. thanks